Landon Campbell, Esme Turpin, Sawyer Warren, Margaret Hodges, Carlton Cannon, Jaquavius Carr, Adina Green, Jakiria McClendon, Journey Smith, Rebecca Gottlieb, Robert Wallace. Thank you to our pages. Appreciate your service to our state all today. Right, thank you. Right. And I want to thank y'all too. Y'all really challenged me on pronunciation today, so thank you for that. So appreciate y'all service today and look forward to working with you. Thank you guys. Thank y'all. Appreciate all your hard work. Mr. President, the journal's been read and found to be correct. All right. Is there objection to dispensing of the reading of the journal? Chair hears none. The reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none, and the journal is confirmed. All senators who have bills and resolutions to introduce, please bring them to the secretary's desk at this time. First, reading and references of bills and resolutions. SB 204 by Senator Dolezal of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to education accountability so as to provide education for recognition. Education and youth. Senate Bill 205 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to licenses for funeral directors and embalmers so Regulated as to industries. Senate Bill 206 by Senator Walker the 3rd of the 20th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to social security coverage for employees of the state and its political subdivision so as to require certain social Retirement. security coverage. Senate Bill 207 by Senator Estevez of the 6th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to conditions of employment for professionals in elementary and secondary education so as to education revise. Education and youth. Senate Bill 208 by Senator Dolezal of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to development impact fees so as to provide Education for development impact. Senate Bill 209 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to funeral directors Regulated and establishments. Industries. Senate Bill 210 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to generation and distribution of electricity generally so Regulated as to enact. Senate Bill 211 by Senator Hickman of the 4th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to education so as to establish the Georgia Council education on Literacy. To you. Senate Bill 212 by Senator Burns of the 23rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to probate courts and Title 21 and officials. Senate Bill 213 by Senator Burns of the 23rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to zoning procedures so as to prohibit local governments from preventing State the continuance. State local government, general. Senate Bill 214 by Senator Still of the 48th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to alcoholic beverages so as to change the number of Regulated retail industries. dealers. Senate Bill 215 by Senator Brass of the 28th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to inspection of public records so as to protect Government from oversight. Senate Bill 216 by Senator Brass of the 28th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to children and youth services so as to authorize respite care children for children and family. That completes the order. Mr. President. First reading of House bills and resolutions. House Bill 81 by Representative Corbett of the 174th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to low wealth capital outlay Education grants. Education and youth. House Bill 143 by Representative Mathis of the 149th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to medical assistance generally so as to require the Department of Community Health, Health to include. Health and Human Services. House Bill 156 by Representative Hawkins of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend an act providing for districts for the election of the Board of Education State of Paul and local County. local government. House Bill 193 by Representative Anderson of the 10th and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to public works, contracting, and bidding requirements so as to increase. House Bill, 1, House Bill 215 by Representative Power of the 30, 33rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act relating to nurses so as to provide for licensure of advanced practice registered nurses to revise definitions to provide for licensure Health and requirements. Human services. House Bill 265 by Representative Carter of the 93rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend an act providing for a supplement to compensation State salary. And local government. House Bill 270 by Representative Schofield of the 63rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to provide a homestead exemption from City of College Park ad valorem taxes for municipal purposes for the State full and amount. Local government. House Bill 272 by Representative Huddleston of the 72nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to authorize the municipal court of the City of Carleton to charge a technology fee to specify the uses to which such technology fees may be applied to repeal conflicting laws and for other purposes. That's my fault. You go ahead. Yeah. House Bill 288 by Representative Parrish of the 158th, a bill to be entitled an act. House Bill 350 by Representative Crow of the 118th, 
a bill to be entitled an act to authorize the assessment and collection of a technology fee by the magistrate court of State Bucks and County. Local government. House Bill 351 by Representative Crow of the 118th, a bill to be entitled an act to authorize the assessment and collection of a technology fee by the probate court of Butts County to identify the authorized uses of such technology fee to provide for the termination of, of such technology fee and dedication State of residual. State government. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary Reed, report of standing committees. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Appropriation has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 18, due passed by substitute, respectively submitted Senator Tillery of the 19th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Banking and Financial Institutions has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Resolution 82, due passed by substitute, respectively submitted Senator Summers of the 13th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Children and Families has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendations. Senate Bill 131, due pass by substitute. Senate Bill 134, due pass. Senate Bill 135, due pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 136, due pass. Senate Bill 183, due pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted Senator Beach of the 21st District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 57, due pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted Senator Beach of the 21st District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Regulated Industries and Utilities has had under consideration the following legislation as instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 95, due pass by committee substitute. Senate Bill 149, due pass by committee substitute. Respectfully submitted Senator Kauser of the 46th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Retirement has had under consideration the following legislation has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 128, do pass. Senate Bill 117, do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Williams of the 25th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on State and Local Government Operations has had under consideration the following legislation has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. House Bill 117, do pass. House Bill 118, do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. Mr. President, that completes the order. Secretary will read bills and resolutions for the second time. Senate Bill 35 by Senator Merritt of the 9th and others, special license plates, specialty license plate honoring Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated established. Senate Bill 46 by Senator Huffsettler of the 52nd and others, control of sexually transmitted disease, physicians and healthcare providers to test all pregnant women for HIV and syphilis at the first prenatal visit at 28 to 32 weeks gestation and at delivery require. Senate Bill 63 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and others, bonds and recognize recognizance, setting of bonds and schedules of bails provide. Senate Bill 91 by Senator Dixon of the 45th and others. Workers' compensation, the time period for the dissolution of the subsequent injury trust fund extend. Senate Bill 106 by Senator Walker the 3rd of the 20th and others. Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Act enact. Senate Bill 109 by Senator Eccles of the 49th and others. Department of Community Health include continuous gluco glucose monitors as a pharmacy benefit for all Medicaid recipients require. Senate Bill 110 by Senator Walker the 3rd of the 20th and others. Back the Blue Act enact. Senate Bill 111 by Senator Huffstetler of the 52nd and others, Anesthesiologist Assistant Act. Anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist Assistant to be appointed in an advisory ca capacity to the Georgia Composite Medical Board provide. Senate Bill 120 by Senator Eccles of the 49th and others, motor carriers, the reference date to federal regulations regarding the safe operation of motor, motor carriers and commercial motor vehicles update. Senate Bill 121 by Senator Anderson of the 24th and others, counties and municipal corporations, local governments from denying the drilling, servicing, or repair of new or existing water wells on single family residential and farm pro properties prohibit. Senate Bill 129 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, primaries and elections time off for employees to advance vote provide. Senate Bill 138 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, Office of Sheriff, procedure for filling vacancies revised. Senate Bill 159 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and others, correctional institutions of state and counties, wireless communications and standalone electronic devices behind guard lines prohibit. House Bill 52 by Representative Thomas of the 21st and others, transportation department of, amend notice provisions relative to meetings for elections of board members provisions. Mr. President, that completes the order. It is now time for our morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? Senator from the 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, y'all. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senators for business inside the Capitol 
39 and 36, sir. Without objection, Senator from the 39th and 36th are excused. Senator from the 42nd. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 55th. Without objection, Senator from the 55th is excused. Are there any other motions to excuse? Hearing none, the Secretary will call the roll of Senators. Signify your presence by voting yay switch. Secretary, unlock the machine. It is now time for the morning devotion. All senators, please take your seats and cease all conversations. I would ask that the doorkeepers secure the chamber at this time. I'd like to recognize uh, one of our new senators from the 6th District here to introduce our, our chaplain of the day. Uh, and uh, pleasure to have Father Jeffries here today. And he's uh, uh, got, to, got, to, got to visit with him a little bit this morning. He's a, he's a fine, unique Prince of a fella, so uh, so I'm we're glad to have him here today, and uh, and I just uh, introduce the senator from the sixth to our pledge of allegiance. Start with the pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the Georgia flag. Good morning, everyone. It is my honor to uh, introduce the chaplain of the day, who is uh, my chaplain of my home church, Our Lady of Lords, right here in Atlanta. Uh, to the church where I was married to my wife, Ariel. Uh, it's also the name of the church, uh, my childhood church in Columbus, Georgia. Senator of the 15th would appreciate that, uh, Our Lady of Lords in South Columbus. So I continued from Our Lady of Lords in Columbus to Our Lady of Lords uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia. Father Jeffrey Ott is a friar of the Order of, the, of Preachers, also known as the Dominican, serving as pastor of Our Lady of Lords Catholic Church, the first African-American Catholic church in Atlanta. Uh, he is also board member of the Interfaith Community Initiatives, a nonprofit which unites people to create lasting and transformational bonds to build more, a more humane and equitable society. And he also is on the board of Mercy Care, which serves, many of you know, uh, the low income and poor with health care. Father Jeffrey uh, is on the leadership team of the National Black Catholic C Clergy Caucus, as well as the Association of the United States Catholic uh, priests. He uh, received his Master's of Arts in Theology and Master of Divinity from a Aquinas Institute of Theology. And before becoming pastor of Lourdes, Father uh, Jeffrey, who I affectionately call him Father Jeffrey, uh, served his alma mater, Xavier University of Louisiana, as chaplain 
uh, as university chaplain. Now, as all of you know, uh, there's a connection there because today is Fat Tuesday. Uh, so let's welcome uh, Father Jeffrey Ott. Thank you so much, Senator Estevez. It is a privilege to be able to call you that and uh, to uh, be with all of you today. Uh, I bring you happy Mardi Gras greetings from uh, my family and friends there in New Orleans. And I want to begin this uh, short time with you this morning with um, a brief moment of silence as we gather ourselves and center ourselves and just do a few uh, uh, deep breaths as we begin. We Dominicans um, uh, are contemplatives uh, and uh, contemplatives in action, uh, some would say, and, uh, and I am very fortunate to be part of that grand tradition now 800 plus years old. Um, it is a great privilege to be uh, serving uh, Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic Church in the community now for 12 years. Uh, and. Uh, I uh, want to greet uh, Senator Donzella James, uh, who is a Lourdes alum, and uh, so glad to have you with us today. And uh, I greet Senator Nan Orak, who is uh, our senator for uh, my district. Um, and uh, it is a pleasure to be with you. Thank you to uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Jones for your uh, kind uh, introduction and uh, thank you all for your attention. I'm keeping an eye on the clock because I don't want to overstay my welcome uh, and being a good Catholic we uh, like to keep things short and sweet. Um, I want to begin this morning with a couple of quotes from some of my favorite people. This first one goes, love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination, full of hope. And that's from Maya Angelou. And another one goes like this. Just as cultivating a garden requires turning over the ground, pulling weeds, planting and watering, doing the work of love is all about taking action. And that's from philosopher, teacher, extraordinaire, bell hooks. And Jesus says in Mark 12, love God and your neighbor as you love yourself. As Senator Estevez has said, we are celebrating Mardi Gras and we celebrate this season of uh, uh, frolic and fun uh, we're, it's coming to a close today, um, and as you know, beginnings always mean that there's uh, an ending, and an ending means that there's a beginning. So just as we uh, uh, begin Mardi Gras, we're coming to the end of that season today, and we'll be beginning the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll see Catholics walking around with uh, black marks on their foreheads, uh, ashes, to remind them of their humanity, to remind all of us of our humanity, to call us back to ourselves in a sense. That's what uh, Jesus tried to do as he uh, served people, as he loved people, as he healed people. He tried to call people to themselves and to their own humanity so that they could see and love themselves and see and love God for what God has created and see and love others uh, just as God loves them. 
we're celebrating Black History Month, uh, a great uh, season of recognizing the history of our ancestors and our forebears, women and men who knew their humanity, who walked with dignity and respect for themselves and for their people and for their culture and for their history, and were able by their service, by their giving of themselves, to uh, achieve great things. Uh, and that's why we recognize them. That's why we recognize their history. Lourdes has 110 years of history like that. People who uh, loved God, loved neighbor, loved themselves, uh, and were able to serve uh, this community and even the state of Georgia. Uh, Senator Dongella James and Senator Estevez are prime examples of that and part of black history. We um, are also mindful that this is a season, a time uh, in our country, in our state, uh, when there is a sense of chaos uh, 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 shootings, murder, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, violence perpetrated against people. Um, poverty is, is at an all-time high. Uh, uh, people are dealing with uh, homelessness and, and uh, health disparities. Uh, and um, so there's a need all of those issues, huh, cry out for leadership and cry out for people uh, to, to help, to serve. And I hope that, I know that as you are called by the people of your district and by the people of this state, that you are serving, you are helping to uh, uh, meet the needs of so many people, so many Georgians in our state by the legislation that you make, by the way in which you uh, encounter one another, by the way in which you encounter your constituents. You are helping to build up this great vision of love that Jesus calls us into. And as my time comes to an end, um, I want to encourage you uh, as we uh, celebrate today, to offer an act of kindness uh, to one another uh, or to another, to someone today. And um, as we close with a brief prayer, uh, I want to uh, remember uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, the Carter family at this time. Um, and so join me, if you would, in a brief prayer. Gracious and loving creator, we call forth in this day the gift of thanksgiving for all that you have blessed each and every one of us with. We ask you to continue to guide and direct the hearts and minds of those who love you and, and the workings and dealings of this Senate body. Help it to create uh, legislation which lifts up all of Georgia and each and every citizen to great dignity and humanity. Gracious God, we ask you to bless each and every one here today that we would uh, know you and love you and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And we uh, ask this and all other blessings in Jesus' name, and we say amen. Thank you.
We have uh, several special groups with us today, but uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a better looking group than the FFA uh, young folks from FAA, FFA that we have here today. I know the senator from the 24th thought I was talking about him, but I, I can assure him I'm not. But the, uh, but they a uh, good group. I was, I was able to speak with them this morning, and obviously our Future Farmers of America is a, is a group of young people that, that uh, are hardworking, dedicated, and, uh, and dedicated to the agricultural business, which we know is so important, not, to, not just to this state, but for all across the country and the world and beyond. So it is great to have them here with us today and uh, I've got our senator from the 24th and the senator from the 8th and the senator from the 20th as well as the senator from the 12th uh, up here uh, alongside these these good-looking young folks we have and uh, secretary read the caption Senate resolution 18 by Senator Walker the third of the 20th and others a resolution commending the Georgia Future Farmers of America FFA and recognizing February 21st 2023 as FFA day at the state capitol and for other purposes Whereas the FFA and agriculture education provide a strong foundation for the youth of America and the future of the food, fiber, and natural resource systems. And whereas the FFA motto, learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, living to serve, gives direction of purpose to these students who take an active role in succeeding in agricultural education. And now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body commend the Georgia Future Farmers of America for its contribution to the welfare of this state and nation and recognize February 21st, 2023 as FFA Day at the State Capitol. Mr. President, that completes the order. Thank you for that. I now call on our good friend, Senator from the Twins from Perry, Georgia. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate. Uh, it's my pleasure today to recognize FFA Day at the State Capitol. Uh, you'll see a lot of blue and gold jackets here today. Uh, I've got the state FFA officers uh, with me on the dais, but we have a lot of uh, FFA members in the gallery. I'd, I'd like to ask them to please stand up and let's welcome them to the State Senate. Founded in 1928, the former Future Farm Farmers of America brought together students, teachers, and agribusiness to solidify support for agricultural education. The name of the organization was changed to the National FFA Organization in 1988 to reflect the growing diversity of agriculture. Today, more than 700,000 student members are engaged in a wide range of agricultural education activities. F the FFA operates on local, state, and national le levels. Student members belong to chapters organized at the local school level. Agricultural education instructors serve as chapter advisors. Chapters are organized under state associations headed by an advisor and executive secretary, often employees of the State Department of Education. States conduct programs and host annual conventions. The Georgia FFA Association was founded in 1929. It is the third largest association in the nation with more than 70,000 FFA members. We're the third largest, but we're the best in the country. <laughs> FFA organization remains committed to the individual student providing a path to achievement and premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. Members live the motto, learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve. FFA members rise to the challenge of service, embracing members of all walks of life united through FFA. If you ever are uh, worried about the future of our country and our state, uh, and maybe a little down, you need to go to a local FFA meeting, and that will boost your spirits, because these are some of the sharpest young people you want to meet. Uh, they are doing hands-on activity to learn about science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, and they also are learning leadership skills. Uh, here today I have with me Gracie Bonato. She's going to speak to us. She's the state FFA vice president. She hails from Northside FFA in Warner Robins in Houston County, my home county. We've also got Haley Montgomery, 
State FFA Vice President from West Lawrence FFA in Dublin, Lawrence County, and other county in my district. Uh, Jack Lingenfelter, State FFA Vice President from Coffee County in D Douglas, Coffee County FFA in Douglas, and Brent Miller, the State FFA Secretary from Decatur County, representing Bainbridge FFA. Gracie, I'll turn the podium over to you. Well, I would just like to say thank you for recognizing Georgia FFA Day at the Capitol. We're an organization that develops students in premier leadership, personal growth, and career success, which means we want students to be workforce ready and gain those skills such as leadership and teamwork. Thanks to you, thanks to you, you we get to have an impact on more than 77,000 Georgia FFA members across our state. Thank you for keeping Georgia's number one industry on your mind. Thank you, Senator, from the 20th for recognizing our FFA members and the association, which is the third largest association in the state of its kind. So moving on to our next guest of, that we have here today in the Senate, we've got a great group uh, from Clark Atlanta University. Uh, we've got the leadership uh, team here today. and. Uh, Proud to have uh, their leadership, Senator from the 30, 30, 36, and Senator from the 50, 50 38. 38. I gotta be reminded of these One things sometimes. Senator. And Senator, Senator from the 39, 36, 38, and 39. And our, and our good, and we couldn't forget our good Senator from the 35th either. So 
Uh, it's a pleasure to have them here today. Clark Atlanta's got a, a, a long historic history here in the state of Georgia. They do a great job. And uh, I now call on my Senator, well actually let me call on the Secretary to read the caption. Senate Resolution 166 by Senators Orock of the 36th, Estevez of the 6th, and James of the 35th. A resolution recognizing February 21st, 2023 as Clark Atlanta University Day at the State Capitol and for other purposes. Whereas Clark Atlanta University was established in 1988 upon the consolidation of its two parent institutions, Atlanta University and Clark College. And whereas Clark Atlanta University was the nation's first four-year liberal arts college to serve a primarily African-American student population. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognize and commend Clark Atlanta University, Dr. George T. French, Jr., President of Clark Atlanta University, and its students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends for their many years of dedicated service to the higher education of Georgia citizens and for attracting young scholars from across the nation to our great state. Mr. President, that completes the order. Is there objection to the adoption of the resolution? Chair hearing none, the resolution is adopted. I now call on the, the young lady from the senator from the 36 here to speak to the measure. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, I'm so happy to uh, bring to you today uh, the leadership of Clark Atlanta University. Today is Clark Atlanta University Day at the State Capitol, as you heard in our privilege resolution language. Uh, the Clark Atlanta University was the nation's very first four-year liberal arts college to serve a primarily African-American student population and offers now 40 academic programs to almost 4,000 students annually. Uh, the, the role of this uh, university cannot be understated. Uh, it is a part of the phalanx of historically black uh, colleges and institutions uh, that uh, Georgia uh, plays host to. Uh, it puts us on the map in a very special way uh, nationally. And uh, we, uh, thanks to the leadership of uh, my, my colleague from the 39th, uh, we are moving ahead as a state to fully embrace and expand the role of the historic black colleges and institutions uh, in our state. And uh, we'll stay tuned for further uh, information on that as we move through the session. The president of uh, Clark Atlanta University is, of course, with us today, along with his staff, uh, Dr. George T. French, Jr. And he has an incredible uh, long list of uh, contributions uh, in the field of higher education across the southern states. He is also recognized locally, statewide, and nationally as having done an incredible job since he's been there since 2019, uh, leading the institution and uh, receiving the largest uh, infusion of a, a, a philanthropy uh, in the history of the college, a historic uh, contribution. Dr. French uh, is, is with us today and uh, comes from uh, 14 years at Miles University, uh, holds a law degree and uh, uh, a higher ed degree with a PhD. Uh, he, is, he is a servant leader and his, uh, in his time at Clark AU, he has uh, built it to, again, new heights with the best yet to come. Uh, I'm so pleased to have him with us today representing uh, Clark Atlanta University, along with my colleagues uh, here. Uh, my colleague from the, from the uh, 38th, who is a, a, a graduate of Clark Atlanta. And two degrees, <laughs> two degrees. <laughs> And we're so happy that, 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 that she could, could be with us today. Let me uh, uh, recognize and bring forward uh, Dr. French to uh, give you some words from the perspective of the challenges in higher ed and the incredible strides that uh, Clark Atlanta University is making under his leadership and 
those other four presidents that came before him. Uh, if, you'll, if you will come forward, Dr. French, we are so happy to present you with a resolution. Thank you so much, Senator Orrick, and thank you also for assisting to represent Senator Horacina Hor Tate in developing the and authoring the Clark Atlanta University resolution. So again, thank you to Senator Tate and Senator Orrick for this re resolution. Most certainly to our Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones, to the President Pro Tem John Kennedy, to our good friend and minority leader Gloria B. Tate, of course to those on the dais with us, to include Senator Anderson and Senator Halpern, who was the chair of the HBCU Study Committee for the Senate. Most certainly to all here in attendance, including my lovely wife, Dr. Bacon French, who has joined us today, and to all of our representatives who are here representing the great state of Georgia. We also acknowledge the vice presidents and faculty members who have taken the time to come to share in this signal honor today. We say thank you. We are going to be very brief because I point to five points of light when I consider Clark Atlanta University. And Mr. Lieutenant Governor, I assure you, because of Clark Atlanta University, the entire nation has Georgia on their minds. <laughs> they have Georgia on their minds because we are the largest private HBCU within the state of Georgia, offering the bachelor's, master's, and doctor of philosophy degrees. Georgia is on everyone's minds because we are the only HBCU in the nation to provide the PhD in cyber physical system. Georgia is on everyone's minds because we are the largest academic prostate cancer research center in the nation. Finally, Georgia is on everyone's minds because recently Apple Company and Southern Company made the historic announcement that the $100 million Propel Innovation Center will be on the campus of Clark Atlanta University in the city of Atlanta within the great state of Georgia, and Georgia is on everyone's mind. Thank you, Senators, for this opportunity, and thank you, Senator C., as well.
It is our pleasure to always introduce our doctor of the day, and uh, Dr. Richard Kaufman is here with us, and it is a pleasure to have him, but I'd like uh, a senator from the 42nd to recognize him, and if y'all, I could have y'all's attention, that would be wonderful, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my honor to um, introduce and thank our doctor of the day, Dr. Richard Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman was, was reared on an Amish farm in Montezuma, Georgia. Some of you may know Yoder's Restaurant or the um, excellent um, woodworking and building companies that operate out of that area. That is the area in which Dr. Kaufman was uh, born and raised. He was educated in the Amish Mennonite tradition. He was an Amish dairy farmer until the age of 26. At that, until that point, his education was strictly parochial through the third grade with no further formal education until 1970. And I was saying to him that, you know, as, as we see more and more problems cropping up with social media, I, for one, admire the Amish more and more and more. But I am glad that um, Dr. Kaufman went on and got his uh, medical degree at the um, Medical College of Georgia in 1976. He is an internal medicine physician in Atlanta with North Atlanta Primary Care. He is also um, has a, a list of accomplishments and service work too long to mention thoroughly, but I do want to mention a couple things. First of all, he has done mission work across the world, including uh, some specific efforts around earthquake relief in Haiti. He has also done extensive work within prevention of HIV with the American Academy of HIV Medicine and the AIDS Research Consortium of Atlanta, where he's a researcher. He has uh, mentored South African physicians on the most current treatment of HIV and AIDS, and he's been a guest lecturer on HIV resistance at the University of Pretoria School of Medicine Grand Rounds in Pretoria, South Africa. He also has conducted a two-day conference on HIV AIDS in Vietnam, where he was the featured speaker. And I could go on and on about that line of work, but um, suffice it to say, this is an incredibly accomplished doctor with um, it, uh, also a fascinating upbringing. And um, please join me in welcoming and thanking Dr. Kaufman this morning. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it is an honor for me to once again be in this august chamber. This is my third time to serve as doctor of the day. Uh, the first two times were when I was quite young still. Now I'm an old man. Uh, but I love what I do, uh, and I don't think I need to go into anything that, uh, from my past, because she did quite a, a well in uh, stating what all I have done. But uh, it was an honor for me to serve God in the way that I was able to across the world at the various places to teach HIV and AIDS uh, to needy communities and countries. Um, I do want to say one thing about the uh, emergency kit that's in our, the, in my, the nurse's office. Uh, I do think that it could be greatly brought up to, uh, to speed with a better emergency kit because really there's just nothing there except just, and there's it, done a whole lot, it can really be brought up to speed. So it's, uh, once again, it's an uh, honor for me to be in this wonderful body, and thank you for all of your services as well.
Are there any unanimous consents? Hearing none, does any senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? I recognize the senator from the 12th. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. And this morning, I rise to pay tribute, special tribute, to a great Georgian, the only U.S. president ever elected from the great state of Georgia, President Jimmy Carter, who is my constituent. We are deeply saddened by the news of President Carter's hospice announcement. He is a role model, a leader, a trailblazer, and an unmistakable gentleman with loads of strength. His first calls for public service began by serving on the Plains Georgia School Board in 1961. The Georgia State Senate from 1963 to 1967, and then as the 76th governor of Georgia from 1971 to 1975. During his time in the State Senate, he was openly pro integration and worked to change laws to make it easier for everyone to vote, for all people, and especially African Americans. As governor, he continued to promote civil rights by increasing opportunities for us and all African Americans to work in state agencies and adding portraits of civil rights leaders such as Martin Luther King, Jr. During his presidency, he promoted human rights through foreign policy, such as reducing foreign aid to countries who did not respect human rights and bringing increased attention to global human rights abuses. Post-presidency, he continued promoting these ideas through his dedication to humanitarian aid globally and here in Georgia as well. Everyone in Plains, Georgia knows President Carter as Jimmy, which is a reminder of the type of humble, loving man that he is. And it is an honor to represent Plains, Georgia and the Carter family as their state senator from District 12. And I've done that since 2009. I give love and prayers to the Carter family and leave you with this quote from our cherished former President Carter that summarizes his life and his work as it continues. If you have any talents, try to utilize those talents for the benefit of others. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Um, couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, obviously, uh, uh, President Carter was a former member of this body, a former governor, obviously former president, his grandson, who many of us in this room were able to serve with. I, I actually roomed uh, roomed, uh, shared office with Jason Carter uh, when I was first elected to the Senate, and and uh, one of the one of the pleasure one of the pleasures that I had serving with him is he he took me down to the Carter Center to meet his, his uh, grandmother and grandfather, uh, President Rosalind Carter, and they are good and genuine people. And let's take a moment and stand, and let's just uh, uh, get a moment of silence. Let's keep uh, put our prayers up for the Carter family and. Uh, and President Carter himself.
Pray for God's grace and mercy. Amen. Amen. Senator from the 30th. So in the last point of personal privilege, you heard about the man with, that symbolizes humanity and humility. That's what, and you heard earlier in the, uh, the priest talking about Ash Wednesday. That is the purpose of Ash Wednesday. So what I would invite you to do is join me tomorrow. You got on your desk of flyers about going across the street down there, right across the parking lot from the depot for Ash Wednesday. You don't have to be Catholic to go. You don't have to be Christian to go. It's just a time to go in and reflect upon your mortality, your humanity, and to create uh, a little bit of humility that each of us could use. So hopefully I'll see you there tomorrow at 1210. I yield the well. Recognize the senator from the 54th. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, folks, we have some friends here today, from, and I'd like to just, if you all would stand, Dalton Whitfield and leadership, if you all would please rise. It's wonderful to have you here in the future. It's current leaders and future leaders of Northwest Georgia, and it's an honor for us to have you all here, and we give you our, our thanks for being with us today. If we give them a round of applause. Recognize Senator from the Seventh for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Amarnam Nabila and Askohoilo, um, International Mother Language Day. My name is Nabila Islam, and today is uh, International Mother Language Day. Mother Language Day is part of a broader initiative to promote the preservation and protection of all languages used by peoples of the world. I am the daughter of Bangladeshi immigrants. I grew up speaking Bangla and English. Bangla is the fifth most spoken native language in the entire world and the seventh most spoken language in the world, ranking behind Chinese, Spanish, English, Hindi, Arabic, and Portuguese. And it was on February 21st, 1952, also known as Ekwishi February, that five Bengali students were murdered as they protested their right to speak Bangla, their mother tongue. They are recognized as language martyrs. And it was Bangladesh that led the efforts to make International Mother Language Day a holiday to be celebrated. It is now observed all over the world. International Mother Language Day also encourages us, encourage us to celebrate our cultures and differences and promote the use of language as a tool for creating understanding. May we always celebrate language diversity and language access in the state of Georgia. I yield the well. I recognize Senator from the 34th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I rise to piggyback off of my colleagues who have already spoke about um, President Jimmy Carter. Um, and I have to tell the story about my grandkids because y'all know how I am about the grandkids. But when I asked, what did you learn in school today? My grandson said, we talked about the presidents. He said, grand, grand. Did you know Georgia had a president? I say, yeah, that be Jimmy Carter. He said, you know him? I say, of course I do. He said, well, why I don't know him. 
I said, because you haven't met him yet. So we made a point to go down to Plains for Sunday school, because we are Sunday school worshipers and we are worshipers, period. But that gave him an opportunity to actually meet with them. And to the senator from the 12th, when she learned we were coming, she literally met us because that is her district and that's who she is. But the kids, the grandkids had an awesome time and President Carter was so generous. He, you know, he and Ms. Rosalind, they took pictures with us. Then they invited us to lunch and we just had a grand old time. But my grandson, being in elementary school, he pulled out his pen and paper and he said, Mr. President, what's your favorite color? And he said, green. And my grandson wrote it on his paper. And then he asked him what was his favorite something else. I can't remember. But he wrote that on his paper. While we were driving back, my daughter said to him, you know you just interviewed a president? He said, uh-uh. I just interviewed my friend. Remember, he said, you're my friend when he shook my hand. So it was just such a joy and something that was worth sharing uh, from my perspective. And since I got a little more time, I want to share with you all my day on yesterday. Yesterday, I was invited to um, the Sim Center for Civic Engagement request my presence because Ariana was named a kid governor for the great state of Georgia. Ariana is a student down at, uh-oh, I'm losing it, and I got a red light that made me lose it quicker. But at any rate, the governor and the lieutenant governor both has these young kids who had to um, qualify statewide, but one was chosen from Clayton County, and fume, she was adorable. But the future is bright with those kind of leaders. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll yield the well. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. And I should have reminded everyone uh, beforehand, but uh, we do have a lot of people signed up to do uh, points of personal privilege. So if everybody could keep it, you know, between three to five minutes, that'd be great. Senator, a person I know that can do that is the senator from the 21st. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, being from New Orleans, I want to wish everybody a happy Mardi Gras, but that's not why I came down here. I came down here to talk about the movie industry and uh, how we are a player in that industry. And I want to thank the Senator, our Distinguished Rules Chairman from the 28th, for arranging a tour yesterday. We went down to AMC Studios, and I will tell you the jobs that that studio has created has been great with The Walking Dead and what's happened down there in that area. But what I want to talk about is not just the movie industry creating the jobs, but the halo effect in the city of Sonoya. Uh, the senator from the 28th showed us pictures of before and after. And you look at the investment that's been made in that downtown and the jobs it's created that because of the movie industry being down there in The Walking Dead, it's unbelievable. And we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at some of these tax credits. Here's the good news about the movie industry. When we first passed those tax incentives, they came here, they filmed a movie, they went back to California. Now they are putting roots down and building infrastructure. And these jobs are permanent jobs, and they're here for good. And people are moving here, and they love our state. So I would tell you, um, we got a great industry. We're a player in that industry. And again, the Senator 28, thank you for arranging that tour. We learned a lot, and, and don't forget the halo effect of what jobs are created throughout that industry. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Recognize the Senator from the Ninth on a point of personal privilege.
Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today in honor of Black History Month to recognize and highlight uh, Dorothy Height, known as the grandmother of civil rights. Born in 1912, Height was active in anti-lynching campaigns throughout her high school and college and earned a master's degree in educational psychology. The ongoing impact she's had on the daily lives of millions cannot be understated. She oversaw the integration of the YWCA and as chairperson of the Executive Committee on the Leadership Conference of Civil Rights and served as president of the National Council for Negro Women, supporting registration across the South for 40 years. She's also played a central role in some of the best known moments in civil rights, in the civil rights movement. While many people know the big six, including uh, Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, James Farmer, Philip Randolph, Roy Wilkins, and Whitley Young, many do not know that she was just as active in the movement. Dorothy's ability to organize diverse groups of people directly led to the success of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where she represented the only woman civil rights organization during the event. She is regarded as being the first person in the civil rights movement to view the problems of equality for women and equality for African Americans as a whole. Later recoined the Kimberly Crenshaw of intersectionality. Widely known for her ability to bring people of diverse understandings together, she was often ca called upon by Eleanor Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, and Lyndon Johnson for advice. She was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1994 and the Congressional Gold Medal in, the 2000 in 2004 for her civil rights activism. As we reflect on her legacy, I want to focus on what so many people call Dorothy's superpower, her ability to understand divergent points of view and facilitate honest dialogue between people of different beliefs and different backgrounds. While our chamber continues to diversify and resemble more and more of the people of the state that we serve, the need for understanding patience and persever perseverance will be greater than ever before. It is critical that we, we rededicate ourselves to understanding others, advocating for the people who do not have the power to protect themselves and forging a vibrant world for our children. I yield the well. Recognize the senator from the 42nd for appointed personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning again, Senate colleagues. I rise to honor today, February 21st, 2023, as Dyslexia Day in Georgia. Dyslexia is the most common learning disability within the United States, with approximately one out of five people affected. And it represents 80% of all individuals with learning disorders. Those who are affected by dyslexia are intelligent individuals who struggle to learn to read because their brains are simply wired differently. They must be taught to read via methods and strategies that aren't necessarily commonly taught in our public schools. For example, explicit structured literacy instruction. We have a literacy crisis here in Georgia. Our data shows that up to two thirds of third and fourth graders struggle to read proficiently. Interestingly, research also suggests that only one-third of children will learn to read without explicit structured literacy instruction. That's why I am extremely thankful for the hearings on literacy that have been taking place this session, led by the higher education chairman from the 4th and the education youth chairman from the 45th and all of the work done by the grassroots group Decoding Dyslexia of Georgia 
to spread awareness regarding dyslexia, address our literacy rates, and provide support for Georgia's children for whom reading doesn't come easy. We know more about dyslexia than cancer. We are aware of how to identify it, intervene at a young age, and support Georgians in the lifelong skill of reading. There are very few medical conditions in which we are this knowledgeable. Let us not let this knowledge continue to go to waste. Let's fulfill the promise of SB 48 by implementing programs statewide designed to address dyslexia. A few weeks ago in our hearings, we heard from Marietta City Schools Superintendent Grant Rivera. Marietta City Schools is where one of the dyslexia pilot programs has been implemented. We have a great need to expedite the dyslexia screenings in kindergarten and first grade. This would cost us eight to nine million in budgetary terms. How much is it costing us to have two thirds of third and fourth graders not able to read proficiently? Far more than that. I'd like to ask all of the folks who are in the gallery from Decoding Dyslexia to please stand to be recognized. Look at this amazing, amazing turnout. I want to tell you that your work is having an impact here in Georgia. We need your voices to continue to engage throughout this process. The work of Decoding Dyslexia, I want to specifically mention Legislative Chair Beth Haynes, constituent of mine, and our state lead, Tina Engberg. Their work has been tireless. Thank you, ladies. It is vitally important, more now than ever, to support the road to reading for not just dyslexic children, but for all young Georgians. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for the group who is here today in the, in the balcony there. Uh, Senator from the 43rd. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to um, recognize leadership Rockdale there in the gallery. If you're still here, wave. Thank you, I yield the world. Recognize Senator from the third for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, I rise this morning to let you know that there is a large contingent of uh, folks from coastal Georgia on the, at the Capitol today visiting. There is a big group from the Brunswick Golden Isles Chamber of Commerce, as well as the, leader, the current leadership Glen County uh, class. Uh, if you run into the Brunswick Golden Isles Chamber group, you'll know them because they're the folks not wearing socks. And uh, all of these people and I would like to invite you to the depot for a reception from 5.30 to 6.30, followed by a seafood dinner. And I would remind you that uh, the good folks from Glen County are bringing about 90% of the most recent shrimp crop with them to uh, cook uh, for your consumption. So we hope to see you there. I don't think we have anybody. I don't see anybody in the gallery right now, but I uh, just thought I'd let you know and invite you this afternoon. Uh, with that, um, uh, yield the will. Thank you.
Recognize Senator from the 50th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today on a more somber note. We got some bad news this weekend. Um, a beloved daycare teacher that's taught in my area for probably 30 years uh, was found, passed away in her home on Sunday. She's taught all three of my daughters. Um, her name was Rita Burton, and um, everybody in, in my county and the surrounding county knew, knew her as Mama Rita. Uh, Mama Rita touched the lives of so many kids, hundreds if not thousands, and um, there are a lot of kids that will be missing her um, this week and, and moving forward. So, Mr. President, I just ask for a, a, a moment of silence uh, to, uh, to memorialize her. Senators, ask for a moment of silence. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Recognize the senator from the 8th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you. I, I too, just wanted to say something. As, as a, uh, a guy that grew up on a peanut farm in South Georgia, I felt like I needed to say something uh, about my President Carter. And, uh, you know, my dad knew uh, both President Carter and, and Billy. And, uh, he, uh, he has spent a, a, a little bit of time at Billy's service station there in Plains and had some good times with him, and Billy was a character. Now, you know, when, uh, when President Carter got elected, his younger brother Billy, they asked him, he said, Billy, are you going to, uh, are you going to go to the inauguration? And Billy said, I don't know. I, they said, Billy, are you not going to go listen to your brother's inaugural speech? He said, well, I mean, I've heard him talk before. Um, Billy was a character, but I have carried both my boys uh, to Plains, and we've gone through the, the, you know, President Carter's childhood home and, and bought peanut ice cream in Plains and everything else. And, um, you know, President Carter's life, and, and that's one of the reasons I carried my boys there. Both of them are farm boys from South Georgia, just like Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter's life proves that in this country, you can be a farm boy from South Georgia and become the leader of the free world. And I am so thankful to him for his legacy and his life and what that means to kids like my sons and what they can accomplish in this country. Um, so I just want to say my, my thoughts and prayers are with their family, and I appreciate his legacy. And uh, with that, I yield the will, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Senator from 39th. Thank you, Mr. President. Today is the 21st of February and the 21st day of Black History Month. Today I want to take the time to highlight an Atlanta native who fought with a tenacious spirit for civil and human rights all across the country. Today I want to highlight the legacy of Reverend Joseph E. Boone. Reverend Boone was born September 19th in 1922 in Cedartown, Georgia. He attended Booker T. Washington High School right here in Atlanta before attending college at Huston Tillotson University in 1950, and then attending the Gammon Theological Seminary School soon after in 1954, earning a Bachelor of Divinity. Known as the picketing preacher, Reverend Boone was at the helm of multiple parts of the civil rights movement. He was a key organizer of the Atlanta student movement, mobilizing Atlanta University Center students to conduct demonstrations, which led to the integration of 70 lunch counters, theaters, and department stores in Atlanta during the early 60s, working alongside leaders like Ralph David Abernathy, John Lewis, and Andrew Young. Reverend Boone was the chief negotiator of Operation Breadbasket, which was the economic arm of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. This program encouraged businesses that sold to black people to employ and promote black people. Boone led a team of more than 200 ministers in more than 30 cities for Operation Breadbasket. As the person in charge of the negotiations with the Atlanta School Committee, he helped desegregate the Atlanta public school system. 
He was chosen to run the initial phase of the Poor People's Campaign at the request of Coretta Scott King, which included arranging accommodations for 10,000 demonstrators traveling through Atlanta to construct Resurrection City on the Capitol Mall in DC. Reverend Boone was known mostly for his activism on behalf of workers. Through labor protest campaigns, he forced the American business community to acknowledge the pivotal role of the black consumer and worker in America's economy. Economic participation agreements affecting upward mobility for laborers, hiring and middle management, improved salary scales were negotiated with a long list of regional, national, and international companies. His motto was simple, find something worth dying for as well as worth living for and die for it daily. Joseph E. Boone died on July 15, 2006 in Atlanta, and 2,000 years two years later, in 2008, Simpson Road was renamed Joseph E. Boone Boulevard in his honor. Located just five miles up the road from here, it sits in my district, surrounded by Maddox and Washington Park. He is remembered by his daughters, Jolanda and Atlanta City Councilwoman Andrea Boone, who keep his legacy of fighting for those who are often overlooked and left behind alive. Thank you. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 35th, would you like to speak from your chair? Thank you, Mr. President. Senators, I have a heavy heart today because two of our great ministers of the gospel, and both have served in this chamber and in the house chamber as clergy of the day in the past. One is internationally known, Bishop James Warden. He is a known musician, singer, and preacher and teacher. He moved to Atlanta after Katrina and made it his home, but continued to minister all over the world. And Reverend R.L. White, the pastor of Mount Ephraim, many people know him as a preacher and a singer as well, but he served for more than 12 years as the state's NAACP president, so he, was a man of God who believed in justice. So we've lost these two giants suddenly on last week and they will both be buried on the same day that our good friend Tommy Deutsch will have his funeral service and that is on Saturday. And so at this time, for such great leaders, I know we've stood for a moment of silence for others, but I think that they deserve a moment of silence. So please join me in giving a moment of silence for Bishop James Morton and Reverend R.L. White, and again for Tommy Dorch. Senator has requested a moment of silence. For them we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 28th. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today on a couple of occasions. Today is BOMA Day, which is our Building Owners and Managers Association, so they'll be running around the Capitol today, so be sure and tell them happy BOMA Day. Uh, secondly, I rise, um, got a very special lady coming up to the Capitol today, and I'll be presenting her this resolution over at the uh, Professional Association of Georgia Educators Day. They're lunching over at the Freight Depot. Um, but this special lady is Barbara Andrews Landreth, and Ms. Landreth is the longest serving teacher in, in Georgia history, uh, and she taught at my alma mater, Noonan High School. Now, I never had Ms. Landreth, all my teachers retired early, um, but Ms. Landreth, uh, she taught for 59 years, so in 1961, she began educating students, and for 56 of her 59 years, she did it in the same room. Uh, that was 106 there at Noonan High School. So she was recognized four times as a star teacher, 
And not only is she the longest serving teacher in Georgia, but also committed to going to work every day to the point that she remembers the exact dates and reasons why she was absent over the course of that 59 years. So um, just her incredible long legacy of educating our state reflects her commitment to public service and really is just can be a great uh, inspiration to each of us as we, we serve our citizens. So uh, thank you, Ms. Landreth, for all you mean to, to the, my community, my alma mater, uh, in our district there in this great state. So, Ms. Lander, thank you for your service, and thank you all. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 45th, and you wish to rise on a point of personal privilege. <laughs> I got you. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to recognize the Association of Georgia Educators, also known as PAGE. Um, I've got a resolution uh, that I will be dropping today, uh, recognized in February 21st, 2023, uh, PAGE Day at the State Capitol here. Um, also, PAGE is the state's largest organization for professional educators with more than 95,000 members who are teachers, administrators, and support personnel employed in every school system in our state. PAGE was founded in the 1970s with the mission to make Georgia a better place for students to learn and for teachers to teach. I commend the PAGE Foundation. There, uh, we've got several members and the president in the back of the chamber. If y'all would rise and uh, please give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> with that, I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. And last, but definitely not least, the Senator from the 51st. Uh, you, you, um, you, are, you are the last person. Just parliamentary Senator. inquiry. State your inquiry. I'm curious, did we miss a Senator this morning that did not get a chance to go down to the well for points of personal privilege? You know, it was very few, but, okay. uh, but point well taken, Senator. Let's, let's move on to business. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. The long weekend got everybody chatty, I guess. You have a consent calendar of privilege resolutions before you. Does any senator wish to remove a resolution from the consent calendar? Chair hears none. Is there objection to the adoption of the resolution on the consent calendar? Okay. The chair hears none. The resolution on the consent calendar are adopted. Are there any motions to withdraw or commit? Secretary, 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 hear the, uh, hear the two resolutions here. Senate Resolution 167 by Senator Butler of the 55th and others, a resolution recognizing January 17th, 2023 as Muhammad Ali Day and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection to the resolution? Adoption of the resolution. Chair hears none. The resolution is adopted. And this is SR. Senate Resolution 169 by Senator Moore of the 53rd and others, a resolution recognizing February 2023 as Career and Technical Education Month and February 23, 2023 as Georgia mm -hmm. Career and Technical Student Organizations Day at the State Capitol and for other purposes. Mr. President, that completes the order. Is there objection to adoption of the resolution? Chair hears none and the resolution is adopted. Are there any motions to withdraw or commit? S Senator from 53rd, for what purpose do you rise? Good morning, Mr. President. I'd like to make a motion to withdraw Senate Bill 67 from interstate cooperation and have it committed to the Committee on Judiciary. As for... Got to get a so we can read the caption of the bill. Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to get yeah, Senate a Bill copy 67. Of it. Okay.
Senate stand at ease while we're waiting on the caption of the Senate bill's request from the Senator from the 53rd. Will the Senator yield briefly? Yes, sir. Mr. Senator, would it be fair to say, quoting the words of Hamilton, that the reason that you're moving this is because you don't have the votes, you don't have the votes, you're going to need committee approval, and you don't have the votes? Well, Senator, we won't know how many votes exist until, uh, well, about two minutes from now. Thank you, Senator. I'll yield for any more questions, Mr. President. Senator from the second. Does the senator yield? Yes, sir. Uh, senator, with the makeup of the committee, uh, has this bill been heard in your committee? Uh, have you worked with your Democratic colleagues on the committee in which you chair to address this bill and bring it up for here? Considering there are only five members, it's very easy to have a conversation with all five of those. And uh, based on uh, previous conversations with them, uh, there's no way that piece of legislation can make it out of that committee. Does the senator further yield? Sure. So you have not had that committee meeting? That's officially. correct, Senator. Yes. Thank you. Um, to elaborate on the senator's point, I have had two hearings uh, and have only ever had two senators show up uh, at any of those other previous hearings. So one more hearing and they don't show up. Uh, Senate rules say we can, uh, the committee on assignments can remove some members. So. I'd yield for any more questions. You have no questions, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Does any other senator wish to stand or speak for or against the measure? So the posture win right now, the senator has moved that the bill that he authors and the committee that he chairs be taken out of that committee and moved to judiciary, and the judiciary chairman has no objection to it. However, we did have objection from the floor, so uh, uh, let me see uh, yeas and nays on this. If, if those who are in favor of the motion will sig signify by raising their hand, raise your hand. Reverse. Yeah. Is there a second to the roll call? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let me see if I need five hands. We got five. Okay. All right. Second machine. On the passage of the motion, the yeas are 31, the nays are 21, and the motion to have your bill removed from your committee to the Judiciary Committee has been granted. You now, uh, so you have a local consent calendar of bills before you. Mr. Secretary, are there any objections filed to any bill on the local consent calendar. Mr. President, no objections have been filed. 
Is there objection to agreeing to the report on the committee on state and local government operations, which is favorable to the passage of the bill on the local consent calendar? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. The question is on the passage of the bills of the local consent calendar. All those in favor will vote yay. Opposed, nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. On the passage of the bills, the yeas are 53 and the nays are zero. This has the requisite constitutional majority and therefore is passed. All right, moving on to the rules calendar. Moving on to SB 13, Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 13 by Senator Albers of the 56 and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code sections 9, 13, 161, 44, 14, 162, and 48, 141 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to where and when sales under execution held and change of place of public sales by court order sales made on foreclosure under power of sale and procedures for sales under tax levies and executions. The Senate Committee on Judiciary recommends that this bill do pass by substitute respectfully submitted Senator Strickland of the 17th District Chairman. The Senate Committee on the Senate Committee on Judiciary offers the following substitute to Senate Bill 13, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 9 13 161 44 14 162 and chapter 4 of title 48 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to where and when sales under execution held and change of place of public sales by court order, sales made on foreclosure under power of sale and tax sales, respectfully, so as to authorize online public sales under tax levies. Mr. President, that completes the order. I recognize the senator from the 56 to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senate Bill 13 codifies work that's already being done by our sheriffs and tax commissioners. As most of us are aware, they typically have some type of an auction on the courthouse steps. Uh, and with the advent of technology, we're a few decades behind giving them the opportunity in law to do that online. Now, some are already doing it online because they feel like they have the ability to do that. Uh, this just codifies to allow them to do that. Uh, this does not change the notice requirements. They still have to go out and be published in the county legal organ. It will give more people the opportunity to bid on those items where a lot of us would be at work on a Tuesday from 10 till 4. Uh, and it really streamlines the process and brings us into the 21st century. Uh, if there are no questions, I will yield the will. You do have some questions, Senator. Senator from 26. Thank you, Mr. President. The gentleman yield. Yes. Does this change the law uh, where if you buy off the courthouse steps, you can't do anything with the property for a year? Uh, Senator, it actually doesn't apply to any residential or commercial physical property. This would only be things such as, let's say they got a, uh, a sewing machine or a iPad or something. Uh, it, it, but the actual regular property, it does not apply to. 
In other words, you're saying this doesn't apply to real estate? It does not. Okay. Thank you. You have no further questions, Senator. Thank you. I'd urge your favorable consideration to help out our sheriffs. Does any senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objections to the previous question being ordered? Chair hears none, and the previous question is ordered. The question is on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. On the adoption of the committee substitute, excuse me, I'm sorry. On the, on the, uh, on the uh, is there objections to the main question being ordered? The chair hears none, the main question is ordered. The question is on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor of the bill vote yay, opposed nay. The senator from the, hold on, the senator from the 53rd, what purpose? Parliamentary inquiry. What's your uh, inquiry? There, there's a rule to exempt oneself if you have a conflict of interest with your occupation, and I'd like to invoke that rule on this vote. Senator, you, you get in your way today all day long here, baby. So, all right, yeah, you're fine. With no objection, you're excused, so. On the pass of the bill, yeas, excuse me. On all those in favor, vote yay, opposed, nay. The secretary will unlock the machine. So the bill, the yeas are 52, the nays are 1. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. Secretary Reed, Senate Bill 22. Senate Bill 22 by Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 23 of Title II of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to hemp farming so as to amend a definition to amend Chapter 12 of Title 16 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to offenses against public health and morals so as to prohibit the purchase of, sale of, and the offering of samples of hemp products by or to any individual under the age of 18 years old. The Senate Committee on Agriculture and Consumer Affairs recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Goodman of the 8th District Chairman. Amendment 1. Recognize Senator from 32nd. I'm sorry. The, we, Senate, the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Consumer Affairs offers the following substitute to Senate Bill 22, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 23 of Title II of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to hemp farming so as to provide for intent, to provide for definitions, to provide for license and permit fees, surety bonds, and eligibility, to provide for and require retail consumable hemp establishment licenses. That completes the order, Mr. President. Senator Summers of the 13th District and others offer the following amendment, Amendment 1, to amend Senate Bill 22 by amending lines 27 and 28 to read as follows. Have revenue produced as a result of this chapter disposited in the state general fund. Two. Senator Albers of the 56th and others offer the following amendment, Amendment 2, to amend Senate Bill 22 by striking on line 159 to 160 for renewal of any previously issued license, a background check shall not be required. Replace with shall have a background check completed every three years from the anniversary date of the license. 
Sarah Albers of the 56 offers the following amendment, Amendment 2A, to amend Amendment 2 to Senate Bill 22 by striking the word shall and replacing it with, the, with each applicant shall. That completes the order, Mr. President. Now I recognize the Senator from the 32nd to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. This bill relates to hemp products that were made legal by the 2018 Federal Farm Bill with a concentration of less than 0.3% THC. Since that time, there's been a proliferation of the sale of products synthesized from hemp, including Delta-8 and other cannabinoids that can be psychoactive. These products are currently being sold in Georgia without any regulation for any age. This is completely separate from either medical marijuana, which can go up to 5% THC, or recreational marijuana, completely different issue. The FDA has recently sent a number of warning letters due to safety issues for these products, especially for children who are attracted by products like gummies that are labeled to look just like products that they may be very attracted to and they often mimic popular brands. But the FDA, in spite of the warning letters, has punted to Congress for further instructions. So I have with me a stack of articles outlining the many health issues that have arisen and the fact that especially kids have ended up in the hospital, poison control calls have gone through the roof related to these products, and there's even been one pediatric death that I'm aware of. So, Hemp-derived products are currently sold in both brick-and-mortar retailers, gas stations, convenience stores, and online. There are no safeguards in place to reduce potential harm to consumers. 21 states have enacted legislation to either restrict or ban these products, and others have bills in play right now. These products are synthesized by chemical reactions, which can involve a number of toxic byproducts, such as heavy metals. Currently, we have no standards for testing for these byproducts. Recent studies have shown that only 25% of these products in retail stores actually contain the amount of THC that is on the label, and we have no labeling standards. We also have no age restriction for these products. This bill applies testing and labeling standards and an age restriction for hemp products with a THC content of less than 0.3%, such as Delta-8. It also provides for licensing and permitting fees, background checks for growers and distributors, and it provides penalties for sales to individuals under 21 years of age, which is obviously the same as alcohol. It gives authority to the Department of Agriculture for spot checks and enforcement, since they're already responsible for, reg for regulating our current hemp law. I have worked with them on this bill to be sure that they could meet the requirements of the bill. This bill is not a ban, it simply tries to add a process for protecting the public by testing, labeling, and protecting minors. I did collaborate with the senator from the 13th on this bill, and he knows more about the industry side of it, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer questions about that part of the bill when he speaks about the bill. Uh, and then finally, I'll just say that the amendments, 1, 2, and 2A, I consider friendly amendments, amendments and I have no objection to any of those. With that, I'd be happy to yield for questions. You do have a couple questions, uh, Senator. Actually, are you wishing to speak to your amendment? Okay, you have no questions, Senator. Um, as, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm actually, I have no objection to the amendments, but I'm happy to hear the authors of the amendments speak to the amendments if they so desire. Okay, I think they're requesting to do it from the well. You can you can yield the well. You haven't have any questions, Senator. Okay, thank yeah. you. I yield. Uh, great job, though. <laughs> Don't forget your gummies, there, Senator. That's a statement I didn't think I'd ever make on the in in this roster. <laughs> so. We have, uh, we have uh, three amendments here uh, with the senator from the 13th which to speak to his amendment.
Thank you, Mr. President. Morning, colleagues. Uh, I want to thank the Senator from 32nd for the hard work she's put in on this bill here. Our hemp bill, in my opinion, that we have was disastrous. And we've basically gotten together and written a hemp bill that I promise you that we think we've dyed all the eyes, we think we've crossed all the T's to make sure the products we get in Georgia are safe. And that's the bottom line. We want safe products. We want to make sure that when you go into a quickie store and you're not 10 years old, or if you are 10 years old, you can't buy products that say 100 milligrams of of CBD or 100 milligrams of this, 100 milligrams of that, because I'll assure you it's all BS because if you took 100 milligrams of that stuff, you couldn't get off the floor. And the problem is there's no testing to go behind any of this stuff. There's no paperwork on this kind of stuff. And it's coming in from China. It's coming from everywhere. And we pull these gummies off the shelf and we test these gummies in independent labs. And they find out these gummies are filled with nitrates, phosphates, fish oils, anything you can possibly think of. And therefore, they're not what I'll consider pure gummies. Georgia-grown stuff is pure. It's tested. It's, it's, it's what we need to be putting out there for people to use. We've also limited the amount of, 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 of uh, milligrams can be put in a package to no more than 500 milligrams. Well, I mean, that's a whole pack. That's a whole month's worth of product. And the products where they're designed, no more than 25 per milligram, will bring these things down where they work and, and they're effectively in the cannabinoids that are pulled out of CBD, CBN, CBY, CBG, and all these cannabinoids that come out of these things are harnessed in the way they're supposed to work for the body. I want to push one more thing out there to you to show you'll know. We moved the age of 21, as Senator from 32nd said, because 21 is obviously a time you can you buy uh, alcohol. Testing requirements on all the products. Each company that sells CBD will pay for a license, and this that company will also have to show testing on these products that they have in their store. So that means every C store out there, and we don't even know how many of them out there now are selling CBD or whatever they want to call it, and whatever their, however their mix is. This will give us some checks and balances in the system to bring it back to where we know what we're looking for. We also have opened the door for, uh, we dropped the fees, the licensing fees. This would allow more people to get involved. We were concerned before there were some on, my, on the other side of the aisle that minorities were not having a chance to be involved. This allows that to happen. We dropped the fees, we made it easier for everybody to be involved. We also opened the doors for farmers to be able to grow a type of hemp that can be used in things like brick, construction work, uh, board, siding, uh, concrete work. We're talking about using it for clothing. We're talking about using the, the, the ground up stalk for feeds, for fertilizer, you know, excuse me, for horse feeds, for cow feeds, for dog food that can be mixed with hemp. I mean, we're doing test markets right now on dog food, believe it or not, that, you know, it's not allowed to be sold yet. But dog people that have come in and they're signed up to be tested, they said their dogs will be 8, 10 years old that have seriously moving around. Their dogs are like, you know, young dogs again. They're moving good again. This thing has so much possibility out there. And the last thing that we've done, guys, is, and I want to reiterate this one more time, is safety. This is what the bill's about. The bill is about safety of making sure when someone goes and buys a product, at least there's some paperwork behind it to know what you're getting. Because I'll assure you, and I don't want to use the word lightly here, most of the stuff you're getting today is China trash. Most of it. We don't know where it comes from, what they bring in by the tons, and they can bring it into Georgia, and there's absolutely zero checks and balances. Absolutely zero checks and balances. And I could go on and explain to you about it. it takes a CBD oil, it takes one part of CBD oil and one part of THC to make medical marijuana. And that's a whole other world, but that's where it's got to be. So you have to have the CBD to be able to make the medical marijuana. Those are parts that re require to make the cannabinoids do what they say and fire the receptors in the body to accept the cannabinoids. Those are type things that we can get into and talk about. That's not in this bill, but the reality of it is, is that's why hip and so important. And the last thing for farmers, and I'll speak about the Ag Department, this could be an entirely new crop for growing for the processes of what I mentioned before, an example of the building industry. And these could be products that grow without, quote, quote, the flowering type of, that you hear about all the time for the purpose of getting the trichomes and stuff out of the buds. But it could be a whole new crop that they could literally grow on their farms and almost have to use zero fertilizer. And they can just about harvest a crop twice a year. So there's a lot of things that's going to come from this as we move forward to it. But this is the first step. And I'm, I'm also okay with all the amendments. And I ask for your favorable vote on SB 22. Thank you kindly and appreciate you. Mr. President, you, no question. I yield the will. You do have a question. Senator yep. from 46. 
He does. He, I got Thank you, Mr. Here. President. Will the Senator yield? I'm dangerous to say yes, but go ahead. I'm uh, going to direct your attention to the bottom of page seven, lines 174. Are you on one the green one? 175, page seven on your committee sub. Current law prohibits a person that's been convicted of either a misdemeanor or a felony involving drugs to be a licensee. You have stricken through the, the prohibition against people that have been convicted of a misdemeanor involving the sale or trafficking of controlled substances. So is your intent now to allow drug dealers to be able to be licensed on? No, sir, growers? not intent to allow drug dealers to be a license on, but misdemeanor affects, not the felonies. If you notice, felonies is still in there. Even though it would involve the sale or trafficking of a controlled substance? I would suggest to you that that is not the intent, the way you're, you're saying it. The, the, the issue is, are you saying that if you're a convicted felon, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. If it's a misdemeanor, that was struck and you're correct. Will the gentleman further yield? Yes. On page 3, lines 47 and 48, your bill adds language that hemp products shall not be considered controlled substances solely due to the presence of hemp or hemp derived cannabinoids. So in other words, that in the definition is THC. Is this gonna change our criminal law that currently holds THC to be a controlled substance and, and punished uh, as a felony offense? No, Senator, not that I'm aware of in any form or fashion. We're still bound by our point three percent as we as we all passed before. Okay. Thank you. Senator from 41st, you have a question? Senator, do you yield? Of course. Senator, isn't it true that there is no such thing as a misdemeanor for trafficking drugs in this great state of Georgia? Senator knows of what she speaks, thank you. Thank you, do you further yield? Certainly. Uh, Senator, I noticed that on line uh, 154, you struck uh, $5,000 for the cap of the maximum license, and brought it down to $1,000, is that correct? Yes, Senator, that is correct. Uh, Senator, can you explain to me why you have to pay the state to be able to grow food? Repeat again, please. Can you help explain to me why I would have to pay the state anything to grow food? or well, to grow hemp, which can be eaten. Well, the reality behind that and the thought behind that is, is as you know, as a certain number of days, it's hemp and marijuana are basically the same plant, as you well know. And the reality of it is, is, is in certain days, it turns to THC, so this is a way of guarding against that where someone will have checks and balances from the local, probably local sheriff's department where it's grown. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. No President, yield the well, thank you. Favor consideration, thank you. Recognize Senator from the 56 to speak to amendments 2 and 2A. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank the bill's authors for allowing me to work on this. 2A is actually just a Scribner's error. This is just going to say that every three years from the anniversary date of getting the license that a background check will still be performed. Uh, while I'm here though, I wanna thank the senator from the six. There's actually another area of this bill we need to do the exact same thing. Uh, and he is scribing that right now. And uh, again, it'll be the exact type of language just to make sure that a background check is being conducted every three years from the anniversary date of the issuance. So every three years. Any questions? Uh, you do have a question, Senator. Senator from the 41st. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I'm wondering, can you, uh, do you have a sense of how much this is going to cost the department in order to run these background checks every three years on people? Uh, I do not know uh, what the cost would be. Okay, and is there any, has the department been consulted about the administrative burden that this would bring on the department if they have to do this every three years? Well, I think that they're already going to perform that for all of the stores that are selling that, so I believe there will be a process put in place. Uh, we have not specifically talked to the department because the amendment just uh, came out of the Senate today. However, I think it's prudent 
that anybody who is in the sale of something that just not too long ago we considered a, a narcotic should have a background check every three years, and that's reasonable. Certainly. Do you further yield? I yield. Senator, isn't it true that I believe that background checks are important? However, I am concerned about the cost burden that this might have on the department because the cost of the background check is not on the grower or the processor, but the cost falls on the shoulders of the department. And, and Senator, I think uh, when the uh, two bills authors uh, between the, the Senator from the 32nd and the 13 came out, they talked about how this will uh, increase uh, the ability for uh, both growers uh, and sellers to generate more revenue. And I think if we took a portion of additional revenue to assure that no criminal activity took place, that's a pretty good use of funds. Thank you, Senator. You have no more questions, Senator? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from the 52nd, do you wish to speak on behalf of this bill, for or against it? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think I'm generally supportive of this bill. Um, our good friend, uh, now Commissioner of Agriculture, was wanting to increase hemp farming and put this forth. And while we said medical marijuana was 5%, that this would be 0.3%. And he um, was also set up testing of this product in the field. Uh, some of the cost is testing it, and it's destroyed if it's over that amount. It all sounded really good but sometimes there's unintended consequences. Um, and the unintended consequence, in my opinion, is Delta-8. Delta-8 is not Delta-9, and it wasn't listed in there, as it is in this bill, but Delta-8 converts to Delta-9. I had a uh, constituent back home some time back who was, their uh, son had come home and he was slurry and red-eyed and uh, staggering around a little bit and they were trying to understand what was going on and <clears throat> he um, told them finally what he had done and they came to me well you know I'm like my first thought was this is illegal they're selling a product above the legal limit we need to do something about the store then come to find out it's Delta 8 that uh, was in the product and is not illegal Delta 8 is not as potent as Delta 9 it's about half as potent because it doesn't all convert to Delta 9. But it's still, you know, when they're handing this out in candies and people, these children and teenagers are eating candy, that's why we've had a lot of uh, calls to the poison control line, ER visits and things like that from people that were taking a lot more than they should have. So this bill, by including Delta 8 in there, um, is the most important part to me of the bill. Now, some people would say, well, you know, it's going to be very expensive to test these products. I'm saying if they're going to sell to our children a product and they can't tell us what's in it, then that's going to be their problem. We, we need to have this product tested. So I do urge um, your favorable consideration. I do have, um, and this would probably be more for the, the lawyers in the group, though, that when it goes to uh, page, uh, well, section 7 there, and it's just talking about... Um, the uh, the THC part in it, I mean the, the Delta 9 in there, are we covering Delta 8 in this section as well? And let me make sure I'm on the right section there. Um, that would be my only, only questions. It, it, later on in the bill it just talks about Delta 9 and I want to make sure that in this bill it makes it abundantly clear that Delta 8 is treated exactly the same as Delta 9. Delta 9 is illegal um, and that was the intent that it could only be a 0.3% level or more. Delta 8 slipped by, and, and to me, that's the biggest problem we've got and the most important reason to vote for this bill. With that, I would urge your favorable consideration of this bill. Can answer any questions if need be. You have no questions, sir. Thank you. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? We've got more amendments. Got another amendment late coming here. So, Secretary, read the amendment. Senate Amendment 
three, uh, Senator Estevez of, uh, of the six um, and Alvarez of the 56 offered the following amendment, Amendment 3 to amend the S Senate Committee substitute to Senate Bill 22 by striking lines 188 to 190 and inserting in lieu thereof the following permit for renewal and any previously issued permit such Such criminal background check or federal criminal history report shall be required for any individual applicant of key participant every three years from the anniversary date and the license. That completes the order, Mr. President. I recognize Senator from the six to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a uh, friendly amendment to the um, to the amendment offered by the senator from the 56th. In the second amendment, we are requiring uh, growers to get a uh, background check every three years. If we're going to do that, it's only fair that we do that for processors of the hemp as well. Uh, as currently stated, the amendment would only require growers to get those background checks every three years. This third amendment would require that processors do the same thing. So h holding everyone to the same standard, which is what I think we did during the, the Ag Committee meeting. Do you have no questions, Senator? I yield the will. Thank you. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. His objections to the previous question being ordered. And I, re I re Chair hears none. I recognize the senator from the 32nd to close debate. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, I would say that the most recent amendment from the Senator from the Six is acceptable from my standpoint. And uh, I have to say, full disclosure, I voted against the hemp bill that we passed in 2019. Um, I won't mention any names, but in this body, I've had several people come up to me and tell me that they had um, chewed a gummy of a Delta 8, and I'm not going to violate HIPAA. But I will say that people are taken aback by the effects that they get from these products. And in fact, nobody really knows what they're getting when they have these products. So this for me is a public safety issue. I think we need to be testing and labeling these products and not selling them to children. And so I would urge you to approve the amendments and vote to protect our kids by a green vote. I yield the will. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator from 32nd, could you approach, please?
Yeah. I recognize the senator from the 56. Thank you, Mr. President. I move we reconsider the ordering of the previous amendment. S senator, senator has moved that we reconsider the order. So where we are right now is we had already called uh, for the order to be considered, the previous question to be considered, and then we had a late arriving amendment. Uh, so because we had already called for the previous question to be ordered, um, we now have to uh, either object or ex upset, accept a friendly amendment that the senator from the 56 is asking that we consider. So, so if there is no objection, the the previous order, the previous question will will be reconsidered. Is there objection? Without objection, the previous question is is now in, reconsidered. So we have another amendment, a late arriving amendment from the senator from the 50th, which put us in this posture and, is, and, and it is uh, gonna be uh, distributed on your desk and I'll let the senator speak to it again. Se Secretary, read the caption. Senator Huff Sedler of the 52nd offers the following amendment, Amendment 4, to amend sub Senate su Committee substitute to Senate Bill 22 by adding Delta 8 THC or before Delta 9 THC on line 275, 280, and uh, on both places on line 281. That completes the order, Mr. President. Senator from the 52nd, would you like to speak to your... Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. In uh, talking with uh, some of those in the in the legal area about my question, they had uh, assured me that that would take care of my concern that Delta-8 is not being treated the same as Delta-9. So it's a friendly amendment. Maybe this bill covers it. I'm not sure it's clear myself. They didn't think it was clear. And so this would just, um, I think, make it abundantly clear. And that's the amendment. And I hope you'll support the amendment in the bill. Is there any other senator that wish to rise to speak for or against the measure? We don't have any more late arriving amendments, do we? All right, so the question is on the adoption of the amendments. So we're going to go with the start with the amendment one, which there's no objection from the author. Is there objection for amendment one? Without objection, Amendment 1 is adopted. Now, the next amendment, Amendment 2A, which I believe the author has no objection to as well, is there objection to Amendment 2A? Without objection, Amendment 2A is adopted. Which puts us at Amendment 2. Is there objection to Amendment 2? We've got an objection from the senator from the 28th. All, uh, all those in favor of Amendment 2 signify by voting the yay switch. All those opposed, vote nay. Unlock the machine.
On the adoption of Amendment 2, yeas are 44, the nays are 10. All right, moving on to Amendment 3. Amendment 3. Is there objection to Amendment 3? Senator from the 36, you, what, what uh, purpose uh, you rise? I withdraw. You withdraw. There's no objection on Amendment 3. Without objection, the Amendment 3 is adopted. Question on Amendment 4 now. N Amendment 4, there is objection. Senator from the 41st has objected. Those who are in favor of the amendment signify by voting the yay switch. Those opposed, nay. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the adoption of Amendment 4, the yeas are 32, the nays are 23, and Amendment 4 is adopted. The question is on the adoption of the committee substitute as amended. Is there obje objection to the adoption of the committee substitute as amended? Hearing none, the committee substitute as amended is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objections to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, and the main question is ordered. The question is on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor signify by voting the yay switch. Opposed, nay. Secretary will unlock the machine. Senator from the 14th, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, Parliament agree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Parliament, Mr. President. Is it not true that as currently constituted post-amendment, this bill now bans Delta 8? Is it not Senator, true that this bill bans Delta 8, Mr. President? Sen Senator no. On the passage of the bill, yeas are 29, the nays are 26. There's a motion to reconsider. Hmm. All right, the, the, the bill has passed with the A's of 29 and the A's of 26. However, Senator from 25th, what purpose do you rise? Withdraw the reconsideration, Ms. Pro. Withdraw the reconsideration, okay. All right, moving on. Senate Bill 61. State your inquiry. Thank you, sir. Maybe we motion to reconsider. You have a motion to reconsider. Is there a second? second There's a second. All those in favor of reconsideration, vote yay. All those opposed, vote nay. Secretary of Lock Machine.
Senator from 41st, what purpose Parli do you rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your, state your purpose. Isn't it true that because of the amendments that were just made, we are now unclear about what this bill actually does as it relates to Delta 8? Senator's passionate about what she speaks. On the and considering the reconsideration of the bill, the yeas are 28 and nays are 27. This bill will go to the bottom of the calendar and be taken up first business day tomorrow. Moving on, Senate Bill 61. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 61 by Senator Strickland of the 17th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 34110 of the official code of Georgia annotated, relating to use of sick leave for care of immediate family members so as to repeal the sunset provision relating to such sick leave requirements to provide for related matters, to provide for an effective date, to repeal conflicting laws, and for other purposes. The Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor recommends that this bill do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Walker III of the 20th District Chairman. Mr. President, that completes the order. Recognize the senator from the 17th to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Senate Bill 61 just eliminates the sunset on a law we passed back in 2017 and extended in 2020 that deals with sick leave. It allows individuals that have accrued sick leave to use some of their leave to care for others and their family that are also sick. When I was in the House in 2017, I presented this original bill. At the time, I didn't have any kids yet. Now I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and I know that when your child is sick, your whole house can shut down because of that. And the same is the case, of course, if you're caring for an elderly parent or a special needs child as well. Being the number one state in the country in which to do business also means being the number one state to work and raise a family. And while we have to be careful um, looking over the shoulder of our businesses, there are certain things that are just the right thing to do and it should be a standard across our state. I ask for support of Senate Bill 61 to make this law permanent. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Senator from 42nd, do you have a question? Senator from the 42nd. You have a question? Your light's on. No question. No questions. All right, thank you. Senator from the 26th, you'd like to speak to the measure? Your light's on, Senator. I don't make this stuff up. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like a question? The dog doing the what? Oh, okay. All right. All right. You you still in the last last bill there? Okay. Any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Chair hears none. Is there objections? The previous question being ordered. Chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there obje objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none. The main question is ordered. The question is on the passage of the bill. All those in favor vote yay. Opposed nay. Secretary will unlock the machine.
On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 54 and the nays are 1. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. All right, so Senate Bill 22 was reconsidered. It moved to the bottom of the rules calendar today. So the author is asking that we read the caption again and, and we will wait for, to hear what her interest will be from that point forward. So Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 22 by Senator Kirkpatrick of the 32nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 23 of Title II of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to hemp farming so as to amend a definition to... That completes the order, Mr. President. Recognize Senator from the 36th, 32nd, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to table this bill. The Senator has moved to table the bill, which will put it into the rules committee so it'd be on the table so 
Any objection to the, mo to the motion? Without objection, the motion is granted. I recognize the majority leader for a motion. Well, thank you very much. It's time for some edibles, Mr. President. Therefore, <laughs> I, I move that the Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. on Wednesday, February sounds 22nd. Like, sounds like that was what the argument was about, whether they're going to be available or not. That's right. <laughs> The majority leader has moved that the Senate stand adjourned until Wednesday, 10 a.m., February 22nd. <clears throat> All those in favor of the motion will say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes clearly have it. We're adjourned.